All right, good evening. Make sure you get both papers there. There are two handouts there. One is on um, channels of thinking. Uh, I printed that out because I realized Pastor Stevens is going into that principle tonight on his teaching, and so that's a pretty good two-paragraph explanation. Some of the information there might be a little repetitive, um, uh, and we could talk about that. Um, there's a couple of uh, psychologists, philosophers, psychiatrists that Pastor Stevens used, and you know the books are in his, his office there. Uh, Rollo May is one of them, and uh, these are you know, some of these principles about the channels of thinking he got from reading those those texts. So, uh, you know, it, it makes uh, pretty good sense if you read those two paragraphs of what, what he's talking about. So, uh, so that's a, just letting you know that. So, so make sure you have both papers. It'll help you. I think even the paper gives you one of the answers to the <laughs> things there. So. Anyway, but everyone okay? So far, so good. You're doing all right. You've made it to the fourth class. That's good. That's good. You made it to the fourth class. You made it to February. Congratulations. All right. So we, we do have a uh, class tonight um, on becoming God's miracles. And, um, you know, you can see the number on it, the number if you want to listen to it again. Uh, but it is, Pastor is talking about... Um, Perception, you know, perception and how you uh, process the thinking, processes of thinking uh, throughout this class. So there's a lot of uh, Greek language and everything uh, that he's going through. So you need to, might take some concentration. I mean, it will, t I know that you concentrate all the time, but just, just follow with him. He's, he's deliberate as he was last week with last week's class, just uh, explaining everything. Uh, pretty carefully, but this is a good, um, good representative, of the, good representation of this kind of teaching that Pastor Stevens did from time to time on uh, the uh, our psychology and our mind and the way that we uh, process information and turn that information, excuse me, turn that information into practical application and wisdom. So, uh, so we'll have a prayer uh, and uh, we'll begin the class tonight and uh, listen and learn and uh, grow in our faith. So, Lord, we thank you for these times together. We thank you for this uh, student body this semester. Every student here was called by you to be a part of this, uh, this part of the local assembly, and we're thankful for their, their willingness to learn and hear and listen from a man of God like this. So we just thank you for this time, this opportunity for us to, to, to learn something new from your mind to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Jeremy, you can start that. Our precious Heavenly Father, we love those songs. They were both beautiful, and they sang them so beautifully. We love the words and the music this morning. The worship time, and now blessed our season appointed in eternity past in the eternal now of the divine is Jesus Christ. The past has gone forever. Now just pass by. Tomorrow does not exist today. But we live in the eternal is of a position which gives us the experiential options of advancing, advancing, advancing in Jesus Christ's degrees of spiritual understanding and application. And we pray that you'll bless this message in this present series. Amen. You may be seated. We have two tapes and this message is ready. Heavy lifting up of our personal cross, parts one and two, and greater grace Christians overcoming all arrogance. Yesterday, we went into psychotic arrogance, neurotic arrogance, and physiological arrogance, and we briefly touched it. We'll go into it more this morning or evening, depending upon time. All right? We'll wait till the beautiful ushers get back. 
so they can hear the beginning, especially Susan, who can very easily be a forgetful hearer, but she's, a, she's lovely in the print shop. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're a great woman. I think. <laughs> there we are. We got our, we're ready to go. And I'm going to pray again. Father, bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to wait. And... Okay. In this series, we want you to think very carefully with us. Every one of us no exceptions. We forget spiritually more than we remember spiritually. Number two, thousands of times we have all heard the Word of God, and the Word of God has become resident in channel A, which is your left side of your brain, it's called the perceptive area or the area of awareness. In channel A, we can receive fantastic academia. A man could be a successful evangelical pastor and be morally upright and never go beyond channel A he could utilize his gift and have a very pleasing and pleasant personality and be very sincere, but live his Christian life in Channel A. Channel A is the staging area of academia only. And that means that I am learning something. Channel A is my learning area. Channel A is not my thinking area. I repeat, Channel A is learning, but Channel A is not, spiritually speaking, thinking. Now, who can know how God thinks in 1 Corinthians 2.15, original Greek translation. Who can know the way God is thinking? Verse 16 says, we as Christians can think precisely with God. So one verse asks who, the 16th verse says we, the Christians, can know exactly how to think. When I hear the word of God or read it, I grow in knowledge. If the knowledge is outside of God's life, it produces an untimely, uncontrolled growth. My life cannot be controlled because I have too much knowledge about many things. The tree of knowledge is simply an uncontrolled growth that overwhelms a person in channel A, in the academic capacity of their existence. When a person understands the cross experientially, in meekness, and in humility, then the Holy Spirit does a marvelous supernatural transaction as a spiritual operation of grace. 
the Word of God says, we've laid aside all superfluity of naughtiness and received the Word of God with meekness. And that means it becomes in rot, what is called by the operation of iskas, I-S-C-H-U-S, which means the Holy Spirit supernaturally transfers it to the memory center of B. B is human spirit. B is God consciousness available for operation. B enters into spiritual emanations with the Word of God down into the soul of channel C under B. The soul is mind, emotions, conscience, self-conscience, volition, and also the old sin nature is resident. And in the soul, the conscience becomes a mirror of what we are really like in our intellect, our disposition, our temperament, our personality, and our character. If indeed the Word of God flows richly from A, B, and C, where we glorify God in word or deed in Colossians 3.17, then Psalm 46, 4 and 5 in application, there is a river whereof the streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. And God will help her right early. That's when, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his emotions, the adjunct of his mind, the appendix of his thinking, shall flow rivers of living water. This I speak of the Holy Spirit, which will be given once Christ is glorified. So now, the river of the Holy Spirit finally controlling my whole spirit, my whole soul, and my entire body. And the streams of that river enter into my conscience, my norms and standards of thinking, deciding, being, and reflecting. And my conscience, with its streams, becomes the mirror of who I really am in my personality, my temperament, my disposition, my intellect, and my character, and also will be revealed in my complexion, which is simply this. It's a quality of existence, that's complexion, it's a mood or a state of mind or ways of thinking in which people are either reject me or are impressed with me, with every one of us. Now, the thing that we've been teaching since New Year's Eve, and it's so important, is Ephesians 4.23. And be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. We have the particle day, which means progressively. We have an iterative aorist that means consistently every day. Think of that. Then we have a Greek word, ananeo, which means absolutely renewed and refreshed with how 
God thinks. And with the power to think with God. Ananeo. Renewed. Invigorated with divine thinking on the earth today. Now, be renewed is pneumatai. And the beautiful thing it is, it is a definite article with a proper noun. The, the definite article, and the proper noun means Holy Spirit. It's an instrument of agency. Think of it. A person is renewed day by day, moment by moment, by the definite article, the, the proper noun, Holy Spirit. That's the instrument of agency. And then, in the intransitive verb, the subject always receives the action of the verb, and it's absolutely complete by itself, where a transitive verb is not complete by itself. The subject acts upon the verb, and it must have an object. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I, subject, love, verb, you, object. Transitive verb. The intransitive verb, the, the verb acts upon the subject with no object. Now you're in one of our morning classes. Somebody says, you're too deep. Oh, go sneeze. <laughs> Wouldn't do you any harm to hear something beyond a Sunday school message for a change. If you, if you want a Sunday school message, there's plenty of them out there this morning that don't even have to study to preach the ABCs. How do you like that? And this goes on TV. They won't like it. Well, anyway. <laughs> Be renewed in the Holy Spirit. Now we have another definite article and another noun. The mind. Now we have the mind which comes from the canon of scripture, Jesus Christ has not spoken to anybody audibly since 96 AD, but he speaks any time we want him to by the instrument of agency, the Holy Spirit, and the ablative of source and means, the word of God. So here's one very little verse that says the Holy Spirit and the word of God will renew you all the time and make you a miracle in your life. Now we have a progressive, present, passive infinitive. And the infinitive is the most unique infinitive. Infinitive means purpose. This is an imperative, finalized infinitive. What is an imperative, finalized infinitive? God is saying, at last, you can have it all the time, every moment. Your purpose for living can be renewed with thinking with God. You receive the action from the Holy Spirit. You receive the doctrine from the mind of Christ. And the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life and the flesh profiteth nothing in John 6, 63. And without me, you can do nothing in John 15, 5. That tells me that every single believer can have the most astounding counseling, the most shocking stability, the most amazing maturity. Every moment and any time something comes up, he kneels or goes to the Word of God or meditation in his car, and the Holy Spirit teaches him the inevitable viewpoint of God. 
Instead of me standing up here and condemning myself and you for not having certain things, which would be a message of works, we have the privilege to receive the action of the Holy Spirit, to receive the mind of Christ, definite articles, proper nouns, present tense, linear action start means all the time. Passive voice, you receive the action that two agencies work upon you. The infinitive is, it's a, it's a mandate to release you once and for all with a state of being. Now give God a hand. Now you see how this works. I don't care who we are. This includes me, subject to it at any time. And the men of God, men and women of God here, believer, believer priests, and you're all believer priests. You're members of a royal family, not a Levitical priesthood. You are all royalty, and if you ever realize that, you'd find it very easy to, in everything to praise God and for everything to give thanks because you're members of royalty. We're the only age in human history that have been members of royalty. We are the royal, and every Christian all throughout the world, wherever they go to church, born again, they are members of the royal family of God. And Jesus Christ is our royal pattern in Philippians 2. Six, seven, eight, and especially nine. All right? Now watch this carefully. Now, we just make our ears available to hear. Here is the obstacles of satanic obstruction. And tonight I'm going into a satanic program and a divine solution. Now, here's the obstacles. Satan says, how is it that you can't experience what you know, sucker? <laughs> Only he doesn't say sucker, except when he has his meetings with his co-host. How you doing after 10 years of Christianity? Want to give me doctrine today? Aletheia means the entire embodiment of doctrine. Now, I'm going to show you something that is so unusual in the Greek. When it says, the mind, be renewed in the spirit of the mind in the original Greek, here's what we have. The is a de definite article. Then we have the noun. And it means... Something different than any other kind of thinking. God is not against other kinds of thinking, such as philosophical thinking, psychological thinking, or psychology, or whatever business. He's not. But he wants you to know that Ephesians 4.23 is stating through the definite article, one kind of thinking. And it's the embodiment of of doctrines categorically clarified in the spiritual and spiritual understanding. This is somebody that really knows how to think in the realm of God's classified thoughts with the spiritual power for the situation. Now here are my options. I have the option of exousia, the Greek word which in the Greek, it means to have God's authority in my thinking. I have that option. When I mix faith with what I hear, Psalm 18, 44, as soon as they heard, they obeyed. Say it. As soon as they heard, they obeyed. The secret was hearing and obeying and not procrastinating. That gets it from Academia into energia, 
operational power in details of life. And a gear is operational power by God in us in the details of life. And a gear is the operational power of God in us in the details of thinking, in the details of life. Now, then we go into dunamis. We take on divine ability. We have divine ability. Divine ability. Ability. Constantly we have this divine ability. And then we enter into Kratos, the manifestation of a divine ability going out to the people we're around. And when the Holy Spirit brings it into Iskas, he supernaturally. What do you think I'm up here quoting scriptures for? I'm quoting scriptures from Iskos. I haven't memorized them. I've studied them thoroughly. Haven't memorized them. That's Iskas. The Holy Spirit supernaturally brought it into the memory center of retention, recall, and recollection, and review. Then he brings it down into a river. In the river, it goes into the soul. So the emotions emote joy. They emote love. As an adjunct, as the appendix of our thoughts, the emotions communicate the life of the ablative of source, the mind of Christ, and the instrument, the agent of instrumentality, the Holy Spirit. Have you got that? Now, follow this carefully. God says this, let this mind, which is in Jesus Christ when he had a human body, let the same mind be inside of you. Wow. Philippians 2, 5. That we might be filled with all the under knowledge of his will, wisdom, and spiritual understanding in our experience or application of truth. Colossians 1 9. I get, I get emotional when I think of this. You know why? Walking on earth and having the mind of God as a, as a little Christian boy from West Sumner and everybody here, everybody in the world, walking around with the mind of God in you? Wow. Woo. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, this is what happens. If I go and hear the word of God for years, but I don't understand my potential to be God's miracle, and every Christian is to be God's miracle, I don't care how much you failed, how much you've fallen, how many times you've fallen. If it was seven times yesterday, I could care less. You are potentially a walking miracle. All we've got to do is to somehow help you to understand by being spirit taught in Psalm 25, 9 and 34. All we've got to do somehow is to help you to see how the spirit helps you receive it and then he collabors with you to implement it all with a positive volition. Now we get into why Christians are psychotic. Why, and don't think of psychosis as somebody in a mental institution. Just think it's somebody that can control themselves walking around outside of the institution. I have studied this thoroughly. Here it is. Psychotic arrogance. Neurological or neurotic arrogance, neurotic arrogance, and physiological arrogance. Now here's, they creep in, and we become weird. We hate ourselves most of the time when we're not defending the way we are. Watch this carefully. First, we have intellect. With our intellect, we have the ability to possess information and knowledge and to use it to make right decisions. 
But what if I had proper intellect and did not have the right disposition? Disposition is the constitutional habit and state of my being. It's my bent in life, so to speak. It's the trends of my essence expressing itself through my disposition. Then we have temperament, the transit state of my essence which causes me to think, act, and decide. Temperament is, is that quality in me that is summarized by my mental, emotional, and physical organization of being. My temperament is also acquired through experiences, difficulties, good or bad. That contributes to my temperament, the transit state of my being. Then we have the personality. Personality is an unconscious thing as well as a conscious thing. Personality deals with my person more than it does my moral being. Personality is that unconscious and conscious individual essence that makes up me as a person and how I unconsciously am motivated through ignorance and self-denial to deny what consciously I want to be. Well, that's pretty hard for you to figure it out, isn't it? Then we have what is called complexion, the quality of an attitude and state of mind that determines your impression of another person. Then we have character, the degrees of morals over, overcome by spirituality, it's spiritual light, controlling moral light through the words of light, and you have spiritual character and live in divine characteristics in the most unusual precious character. Now watch this. In thy fountain there is life, but in thy light we, we see light. That's Psalm 36, verse 9. This is what it says. The entrance of God's words give light. 119, 130, and understand to us that do not have capacity. Now, we hear the word of God. It brings in light and a fountain. Now the Holy Spirit transfers it into the memory center supernaturally. It transfers it into God's frame of reference supernaturally. It brings in the river of the Holy Spirit that makes us glad. It brings in the mirror of life from scriptures into the streams of conscience. Now we are reflecting Jesus Christ from glory to glory in 2 Corinthians 3.18 by the same Holy Spirit. Through the mirror of the word of God, we reflect the Holy Spirit. That means the characteristics of God because we're not only thinking the way he thinks, but we have his same power. We have his authority. We have his ability. We have his operational energy. And we have the manifestation of his wisdom. Doesn't that make you feel good? I like myself all of a sudden. We are becoming God's miracles. The way we think is a miracle. The way we emote is a miracle. The what we decide is a miracle. The way we resist the devil becomes a miracle. The way we ponder and meditate in the quietness of a room, in the solemnity of our own privacy becomes a miracle. We live as a miracle of regeneration, a miracle of grace, a miracle of mercy, a miracle of forgiveness, a miracle of 
power. Now, watch this one. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder the joints and marrows and soul and spirit, and is a critic of the motivations and thoughts and intentions of the heart. And every creature is naked before God. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. Now, Hebrews 4, 12 deals with revelation of truth. What I read in Vine's dictionary or some library of explanations becomes me and becomes you through the revelation of the Holy Spirit's rhema. It is yours and it becomes your intellect, your disposition, your temperament, your personality, your complexion, and it becomes your character. I guess we could put it this way. As he is in heaven, so are we in this present evil world. 1 John 4, 17. We start revealing the life of the Son of God as Paul did in Galatians 1, 15 and 16. We begin to take on a fantastic disposition, a precious temperament. Our personality takes on a divine origin. It's not I, but Christ. The late Bishop Sheen, I've said it many times. I loved, I loved it when he said this. And nobody in evangelical circles would give Bishop Sheen credit for this. I'm going to. I'm going to quote his name. I don't care if you don't like it or not. You may send me some bad letters. I'm quoting from the late Bishop Sheen. He's in heaven now, so just forget it. <laughs> and you're going to be surprised when he gets rewards. Now watch, he said this, how can a man that is spirit-filled have his own personality? He may have individuality, and he certainly does. Everybody is an individual. Everybody's an individual. We have individuality, it must be dealt with. But when you're spirit-filled, you take on God's person in spiritual reality. That's called God's personality. I don't want my fallen personality, even if it was charismatic and filled with charisma. <laughs> Remember, I'm not trying to say we don't have individuality. I've been misquoted so much. I'll just repeat that for the record. I think what we'll do is to say this. When the Bible says the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint, that's talking about neurosis and psychosis without going into a mental institution. You can even provide for your family and not kill anybody. <laughs> Publicly, you can screen your disorders with smoke screens of intellect and emotional restraint. There's not a Christian living that has not been under the definition of God. A person that has lived in psychotic arrogance. There's not a Christian living that has not lived in neurotic arrogance. And there's not a Christian living that hasn't lived in physiological arrogance. Arrogance is different than pride. Pride exalts itself against its fellows. Arrogance exalts itself against God's words by rationalizing them with self-justification, self-deception, self-absorption, and self-defense mechanisms. That's arrogance. It becomes a complex. It's a house to protect the real you and the real me when I want it for my protection. As a, and I use it as a social skill to be accepted when I have to be accepted socially. Arrogance is a skill of social acceptability. Ex 
extensive depression, extensive anxiety is caused by arrogance. Now, you say, how can you say that? I'll say it like this. If I have the privilege to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, if I fail, name it. Receive the filling of the Spirit. Receive the precise word of God and overcome everything that's this in this world from faith to faith. And when I hear something, I obey it. As soon as they hear it, they obey. Then I have a solution. And my solution is a divine provision with divine power through a human choice. I have a solution. Now, if I reject that solution and let the word become academia to frustrate my self-essence, and I let it become academia. Well, if you could have a glass of water and something would be in the water to, to save you from cancer, wouldn't it be arrogant if you wouldn't drink the water? I think so. I mean, if I have a solution that is free, that is by grace, I can have it through faith, obedience, and I am bigger than the solution, and I reject it, and I cast my knowledge against the knowledge of God in 2 Corinthians 10, 4. I will not bring my thoughts in subjection to humility, and I go against the knowledge of God with my own human reasoning. Remember, my untimely growth without life, receiving too much knowledge without life, that's what tree of knowledge is. It's overly growing in knowledge without Christ and the cross. That's what frustrates us and brings us into so many psychotic and neurotic disorders. While we strive to be socially acceptable, then these bring seeds of suicide because of despair. We frustrate the grace of God because it's not operating in us. As they say, need I say more? <laughs> All right, did you? You know, isn't it nice to watch a preacher having a good time delivering what God gave him? I mean, we're spoiled that way, but it is kind of interesting. I just, when I'm watching that, I'm just thinking, man, pastor is like having so much fun telling us all of the stuff that God has poured into his brain and heart. It's amazing. All right. So yeah, you can uh, take a break uh, and uh, get a coffee or something, come back in 10 minutes and we'll uh, discuss some of the things we heard tonight. All right, are we prepared? Are you all good? Okay, we're going to start here. Just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a very, um, yeah, this is a, you had to pay attention. You know, this is pastor taking us yeah, there's that kind of thing. So I think Pastor Shaw and I were talking, so we think trying to get the get this down, uh, get this down in our in our understanding. Uh, just the way that we are constructed as people and human beings, and how we uh, receive information, process information, and turn that into you know wisdom. You know, um, thankfully, the Bible is good, especially the Old Testament, I think. Um, I think the Old Testament's really significant, and I, and I hope that you think that too, that the Bible didn't end it, you know, didn't start with Matthew chapter 1. It actually began with the beginning. Um, and in the Old Testament, there's a lot of uh, figures and stories that sort of um, illustrate illustrate the reality of who we are as human beings and the kind of struggles that we have. And uh, the book of Psalms and Proverbs are so effective for us. That's why, uh, you know, it's a good process to sort of work through those. Uh, you know, I like to work through them a month at a time, you know, 
And, uh, but there's this place, I'm thinking, when I'm listening to Pastor Stephen's talk, and I'm thinking, is my, is my person really like that? And like, am I really that way? Like, I see it like I have a physical body, and then I have a psyche, a soul, sort of an understanding of who I am. And then there is like a psycholo psychology in me, like how do I order thought processes? So I am a body, and then I am also these other things. And um, I, when I get to the Psalm 42, 43, 44, there's this place where David is wrestling with the feelings that he's having, and you see like there's conversation going on internally with him, because he says in a couple of places, um, my soul, why are you so disquieted within me? Hope in God. And it's like David is talking to David. This part of David is talking to the other part of David. And, um, you know, uh, if you collect information, and just for collecting information, you can become you can become very good Jeopardy player. You can become very good at Trivial Pursuit, which is I don't know if that if that game's even that was a game years ago, but you knew a lot of trivia and you could answer questions. You know Jeopardy people they answer questions on the show. How many have watched Jeopardy before? You know, so you know it's like they know a lot of information. Some you know it's like obtuse information, information from the ends of the earth. There's a proverb that says some people's eyes are only on the ends of the earth. They know all the little details. And pastor is saying that that's the life at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a book for you if you ever find yourself look, living at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's called Ecclesiastes. You can find out. It's like there, it's like it's a very, it's kind of interesting literature for us to read because we're not quite sure what to make of it. But it is like it's like somebody telling you, this is how it's like if you live at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You find out one fact, and then you find out that this fact contradicts that fact and that fact, and how do you, you, know, how do you get around it? It's like you run around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So our minds can collect information, and uh, it doesn't really become anything very powerful. But, you know, I think to emphasize what Pastor Stevens was saying is there is an availability to us. And that availability is the scriptures. And in the scriptures, we have the mind of Christ revealed to us. And then as we hear the word of God, and as we obey the word of God, and then as the Holy Spirit is uh, filling us, we have a capacity to live by the word of God in wisdom. To live in, and we can talk to our soul. We can talk to our soul. Our human spirit, which is uh, being uh, led by the Holy Spirit when we're filled with the Spirit, we can talk to our soul. We can tell our soul to sit down and be quiet, you know, hope in God. Sit down and be quiet, hope in God, you know, because the soul always wants a reason. Pastor's message last night, Pastor Shower's message last night about uh, what was the three things? <laughs> Opinion reasoning and subjectivity, feeling. So there's your soul over here with its opinions. It's collected a lot of information. It's processing that information. It's organizing along human terms, sort of like on a, on a human logic. So there's a reasoning to it. And then, you know, it lives in the feelings, you know, lives in its feelings, it's, you know, and that is, you know, you can, you can live by the truth that you're taught from the Word of God and then when your soul is disquieted, you can speak to it, you know. I don't, you know, you, you might as well face the fact. We are all multiple personalityed, you know, inside our individuality, to quote Pastor Stevens. We all have like, you know, we always, and Pastor Schaller's messages lately about this heart, that heart. We have the new heart, but we also have this lingering thing that speaks and tries to get us, bring us into the realm of opinion, bring us back into the realm of human reasoning, and get us to live subjectively, to live without the wholeness of what God would communicate to us. And so, you know, what we got today is, you know, this is a, you know, I'm glad that he was deliberate, he was careful, but he was also like, you know, really enjoying himself. 
you know? I mean, I guess that's a goal to be like, if you're a preacher and you get something from God, you should like, you should have an unction. Uh, Charles Stanley called it the unction. It's like you're so full of what God has given you, you just can't wait to tell everybody about it. And, you know, and again, pastor had a lot to say about those kind of things. So, okay, does that make sense? You know? Okay, so uh, when you talk about complexion, that's a word maybe you haven't heard of. I would say that we were taught that there's a soul structure. There's actually an old booklet called Soul Structures. And uh, this is, a, again, from Proverbs, that there are rooms of our soul and our, we furnish those rooms as we learn truth. And so, I mean, you can imagine yourself, your interior, you know, there actually was a very, there's a, I forget which, there was a, there was a mystic Christian, a mystic Catholic Christian, Teresa, I think it was, she wrote a, wrote a pamphlet on the interior of the soul. And like you have an interior and like you can allow the Holy Spirit to put the furniture in that. Like in, the, in, the, in you, there's a great song by Sarah Groves that goes, in the girl there's a room, in the room there's a table, on the table there's a lamp and the lamp won't go out. So it's like all of us could be like that where there's a rooms in our soul and our souls need a table and on the table there's a lamp that won't go out. So you could allow like your soul to be furnished by truth, as the Holy Spirit does that to you. And so your soul structure, the complex that is inside of you, you know, do you think you're complicated? <laughs> yeah, we are. We are complicated beings. We're so, you know, it's because the tree, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil has unleashed all manner of hell upon us. And the devil's very good at like, like bringing every kind of detail to face us. And God is saying, just come and sit under the tree of life with me and enjoy me, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't know. That's, is that good? I don't know, Pastor. All right. So maybe talk, you know. Okay, let's do this. Let's practice this. Okay, take a moment. Tell your soul not to be disquieted. Go ahead. Just, you don't have to say it out loud. But if you talk to yourself, it's good. I have good conversations with myself. It's amazing. Me in the car, it's just amazing. If you see me talking, I'm talking to I'm not always singing. I'm talking to myself. Uh, so talk to yourself a little bit and then talk to someone near you a little bit. That's right. Exactly, Patrick. <laughs>
Okay, oops, it's a little bit loud, maybe. All right, uh, we could go through some scripture together. Uh, the first one maybe is what Pastor Steve mentioned, Proverbs 24. Uh, would you turn there with me? As we kind of break the class down and make it real, as clear as we can, you know, it's, as Pastor Steve said, it's, um, we have a natural mind, natural way of thinking, natural life, and then we have a renewed mind, okay? So, uh, before we turn to Ephesians 4, look at Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established. So Pastor Steve mentioned a room, a table, a lamp on the table. So, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So there is the metaphor for our mind, our life, our house um, is built, it's filled with treasure. Your heart and your mind filled with treasure. How much treasure do you want? And what kind of treasure is it? What are the most important realities in life? What are the most important realities? We have two categories. We have material reality and immaterial. Which is the most valuable? Money. Give me money. Real estate. Give me real estate. Cars. Give me cars. People. Give me people. Or immaterial. What are they? What? Love. love. Very good. Okay, love. We you leave it at that. If my house can be filled with love, you know, we have buildings that are called houses, but we have a home. What's a home? What's the difference between a house and a home? What's in the house is a home, right? A home, a place of rest, peace, love, joy, a home. Well, how about in me? How about in me? So you have a new life and you, your, life, your house or your home is filled with treasure. Look at verse 4. And by knowledge, now what does he mean knowledge? Flip over. So we'll just turn in the Bible for this part of our class because that you need the Bible. You need to know the Bible and read the verses. Because I think when you're in Bible school, you write down the verses and you don't read them. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and just say, you do that, I know you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. Yeah, I'm talking to you over here. Oh, yeah. I'm talking to Lydia in the back. Oh, yeah. Okay. So turn... <laughs> Turn to Philippians chapter 1. It, the, the scripture will change, you know, it'll renew your mind. That's what the class was about. Philippians 1, 9. Now you can remember Philippians 1, 9 with Colossians 1, 9. Okay. So let's write it down. Philippians 1, 9. We have a word knowledge, I believe. Colossians 1, 9, this is how I remember it. They both say similar. And they were written like the same time, right? Philippians and Colossians. So Paul just says this, verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. So the, he has a link between love and and knowledge, and that's what you want. Your house would be filled with knowledge and also precious, uh, precious things, precious things in your house. Now turn to Colossians with me, 1 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So we have knowledge. Is it important? 
It is, but many times you think about knowledge is bad because 1 Corinthians 8, verse 2. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. In the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Verse 2. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought to know. Right? Look at verse 1. Now as teaching things offered under idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. What, what does it say? Knowledge puffs up. But what if, what's that mean, knowledge puffs up? What's puff, puffing up mean? What? Proud, okay. Puffing up, anybody? That's good, that's true, vaunting myself, puffing up, inflating myself, my ego, inflating, I know, I know, knowledge. However, he, he links love with knowledge, and what about that? Love and knowledge together, right? That's, that wasn't that Philippians 1.9? Okay, that your, knowledge, your love would result in knowledge, so that can be knowledge goes together with love. Like, but he calls it spiritual knowledge. Like to know things. It's what you're learning in Bible school. When you hear something that touches your heart, that, that's, that's interesting for you. Because, listen to this. One very important part about your new life is this word, Understanding. Understanding will change your life. It will. When you understand something, it is so satisfying. You, you, you understand something about God. You know something about God. It's revealed to you by God. That takes a certain mind. And that mind is given to you in Ephesians 4.22, this was his text for the, his message. Turn with me there. Ephesians 4.22. <clears throat> that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. The old man. Turn to your neighbor and just say, you look like an old man. <laughs> Go ahead. You old man. It's, yeah, you old man. Old man. Now, why does it say old man? What? Here, here's, the, here's the lesson. Very simple. How many atoms are there? There's two, yeah. The first atom and the last atom. Who's the old man? Why is he old? He, ha he hasn't changed. From the day he was, he fell as a sinner. He hasn't changed for thousands of years. He's the same old man. But who's the new man? That's Jesus, the second Adam. He's new. Now, listen, if you and I live in the flesh, it's the same old story. It's the same. And who else is old in the Bible? The old serpent. Revelation chapter 12. He's the old serpent with the old man in the old ways. What's the new age movement? It's the old story. The new age. There's no new age movement. There's no new age. It's the kingdom of God is the new kingdom. It's the kingdom that has no end that is continually new. Now there's, a, there's two Greek words for this new word new. And I'm trying to remember, um, we've got chronos, and I don't have the, uh, this is for, your, for um, time. And we have uh, Cairo, is it Cairo? No, I'm, I'm out, off, out, I can't spell it. Uh, you, you are, the old things, if, the, if, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, new creature. That word new 
is not new in terms of like old and old, old, like two days old and something new. It's a word for, it's, it's a new, uh, it's a new dimension. It's a new reality. It's a new thing for us. That when Jesus comes into us, it's like not new in terms of time, like it's a new year, a new day, a new month, a new mood, a new trend, a new religion or something. No, this is a new, a new reality to us. It's the mind of Christ. When you are born again, you have a new life and your mind is new. Or we say, in Romans 12, 2 and 3, it's re the mind is renewed. Now go to Ephesians 4, 22 again here. That you put off concerning the former conversation. What does that mean, former conversation? Maybe you have a better translation. Former conversation. It's King James. It's, what does it mean? Conversation used to be in old, old English, conversation... Like today, we use it strictly for a conversation, a verbal, verbal conversation, but it meant actually a way of life. You put off what, the way you used to live. It was a kind of communication, uh, exchange, connection in society. Your former conversation, you put it off. And what happens, verse 22, it says... Uh, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And by the way, deceitful lusts, what a good word. We tried to preach on that a couple of Sundays now, and I don't know, I'll share it with you right now for, for a minute. We got, um, we got deceitful. It means it'll trick you. Deceitful. And we have the lust. So we have a we have the description, it will trick you, it will catch you, it will bait you, it will catch you in a trap. The bait is very good bait, and it's a, lo a lust that will catch you. So you're, the lust of my sin nature will deceive me and change my mind. And I will start to talk about bad things. Watch it. This would be a good little exercise if you can think. When a bad thing is, is explained as a good thing, that's what you can do. You can say adultery, and you can just say, I fell in love. And everyone understands that. And everybody does it. And it happened to me. I can't believe it that it happened to me, and I am so much in love. And this is reality. This is reality. And God would say, it's adultery. And then you say, no, it's from God. It's from God, 100%. I'm sure of it. I know it is. What happened? My lust deceived me, changed my mind. Uh, you can take many things, like alcohol, like you can say alcohol, what does it, 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 it's a poison. It destroys families, driving accidents, uh, loose tongue, um, bad decisions, miss my judgments, and then I just turn it to, it gives me peace, I relax, I have a lot of fun with my friends, we, we socialize and just add a little alcohol, and the thing is a good thing. It's a good thing, I swear, I know it is. It's a good thing, and I want to live with it, and I have it, and it's good. I'm under control of it. Okay, that's how we go. And it can be from, uh, uh, well, we're good at it. We're good at it. Like a woman who has many abortions, and I, I'm not thinking of anyone, I don't know anybody for that, I'm making up the story. So, like, I want you to understand, I sympathize and I understand. But the hard thing for us to admit is that sleeping around and getting pregnant and getting rid of the baby, and this is protecting my body, 
And this is the way we do it in the 21st century. And this is normal. And I've talked to counselors, and I believe in this, and this is fine. I have a right to my own body. And we say, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you, are you, I want to know God's mind on it. And I think you're making a mistake by sleeping around and getting pregnant and living that lifestyle. And if you didn't do that, then you wouldn't have this. You know, you, know, you, you follow what I'm saying. What, what is this? I, in my, my nature, I have a deceitful lust that can convince me. And I can reason and argue. And I call... Turn to Isaiah 5. You should know this verse. You guys are good Bible readers. I know you are. You're good Bible readers. You, you're reading your Bible. Wow. You get a card, index card, and you start reading the Bible and writing the verses down. You just get hundreds of them, hundreds of Bible, index cards. My son Kyle had to, re, had to memorize 700 uh, anatomical terms when he was in uh, school for, you know, medical school and he just got cards and he just had to memorize all these terms yeah, you know, I just had to do that, 700 of them and um, uh, and I'm thinking here we are in bi Bible school and we do the same thing but those terms don't, don't have the power that these terms have yeah. And these terms can stick with you your whole life. And it takes some discipline, but you can do it. Okay, Isaiah 520 is one of them. Woe unto them, they call evil good, and good evil, they put darkness for light, and light for darkness, they put bitter for sweet, as sweet for bitter. And you should pick up on that in the culture. Pick up on it in the culture and recognize it when they do that. They say, this is sweet. And you go, no, that's bitter. I don't like it. And they say, this is bitter. No, that's sweet. I like that. That's good. This is darkness. No, that's, that's, that's light. That, I like it. And then, now, this Sunday, we have a Super Bowl game and the quarterback for San Francisco, his name is Brock Purdy, and he's a rookie, and he's a Christian, and he's outspoken. And they asked him some questions. He had some interview, and they, he, they asked him what Bible verses uh, has helped him through the season. And he gave Bible verses. He said, these Bible verses have affected my life so that I could, I could play this season, first year. And people are shocked at how good. He's not that good in one way, but maybe God is with him. Who knows? I don't know. And I'm not predicting the game. I don't know about that. But I'm just talking. <laughs> Let's get in an argument right now. Hey. Yeah. So anybody that would be, like, outspoken, and there'll be people that will be saying, you know, that's darkness. And we'll say, no, that's light. You know, that's bitter. No, that's sweet. No, I believe. So that, okay, so we got the, a little bit of an orientation. Of what a, Ephesians 4, go back there, please, to 23. And we see, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And Pastor, basically the lesson was about that verse, 23, and a very big emphasis on what that, what that is. It's a real renewal of the mind. Okay? And I just want to say to you, God speaks to you. God helps you. He renews your mind. I'm not kidding. This book helps us. And things come to our mind. Yeah. Is that good? Why is the mind important? Because uh, 
Look at the condition of it. Turn to Isaiah 1. In verse, another very fundamental text here. Verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> and also, Pastor talked about these Greek words for power. The English, there were power, authority, these words, and he used them. It was iskis, right? Iskis was one. Exousia. You can look these up in a vine's dictionary. Exousia, energia. The point of him making these these word references is to, to emphasize dunamis, and and this, you know, where we get the word dynamite, and then he had kratos, C K R A T O S, kratos for power, democracy, you know, kratos, cosmo, krator is the devil, of First John five. All right, so he, he wants to make it clear that it's a real thing that your mind is affected by God. It's a very real thing that you have the same mind as Christ. That's essentially what he's saying. Like, is it real? Does he really affect my mind? Yes, because if you look at Isaiah 1, Five and six, it says, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there's no soundness in it. But wounds, bruises, putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Now, the text, you should memorize those two verses, okay? You should know them real well. But if you see the context of the text, you go back to verse 2, 3, 4. He's saying, animals know their master's crib. Animals know where to go. Animals, and you can add in there, I'd like to do it. Fish know where to go. Insects know where to go. But my people don't know. Like whales know where to go. Bears know how to live in the woods. But my people don't know how to live because their head is sick, okay? That's the problem. And we have our theological orientation is the knowledge of good and evil at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We've lost our, our, uh, our you know, we've lost our, our, um, our thinking is not right. We've lost our many things. We've lost. You know, you can, I'm not going to say, we say it all the time. We lost God. We lost a sense of who we are. We've lost our purpose. We can live like, 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 like very dumb. Job uses the ostrich as an example. Does anybody know the example of the ostrich? A few of you? Okay. Anthony, what is it? Huh? Yeah, okay. It, 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 it sticks its head in the sand. But what, it, what, what does Job say about it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the text, though, Job, Job 39, what does it say? Okay. It will lay its own eggs and then break its own eggs with its feet. Okay? Why? Here's a bird. Usually, bird, birds are very wise about their eggs. They, they know their eggs. They, even all the same birds, they will, I, you know, these, uh, I, I won't go into it. It's a whole, me, a whole thing, but they know their eggs. They know how to take care of their eggs. They know what the egg is about. They know that's their, that's the next generation. Mm -hmm. Also, Jesus says, God has deprived them of understanding 
so they break their eggs with their feet. So they're just clumping around. Crunch, crunch, crunch. That's a bird that is stupid. And it, and it looks like God made that bird to say something to us about, about us. We also can destroy our own family. We can destroy our own life. We can destroy our future. That's why if our head is sick and our heart faint, we can quit when we're very close to success. Guys, my heart is faint. I can, I can destroy something that's very good. Have you ever put something together and you go, oh, this piece, of, this piece isn't needed, throw it away. And then as you're putting your bicycle together, you go, hey, where did that, what? You know, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, Dad, you know the thing you threw away? Yeah, that was important. Okay. What, what's the message of Dr. Stevens tonight? That, that the mind renewed has a huge effect on our understanding. And understanding is the key to our spiritual uh, our, it's key to life. We all understand that we should fear God and respect Him. We should understand what holiness is. We should understand what humility is. We, you know, we should understand what the value of the Word of God, the body of Christ, the purpose and plan of God. Okay. All right, so uh, we, one more thing in a minute, but I'll let you talk. So go, go ahead, talk if you like. Say to your neighbor, you know what? You know what? I think you have a tendency to crunch, crunch. By the way, you better turn to Job to read it, just because that's another memory you can use, Job. 39. 13. Job 39. Uh, verse 13, down through to 17. <coughs> Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaves her eggs in the earth and warms them in dust, and forgets that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear because God has deprived her of wisdom. Neither has he imparted to her understanding. Huh? Like, whoops. You know. How about this? A guy gets married, he has a family, everything's going good, and he's like, he just just decides he's abandoning abandoning his family. He's going to move to California on his own, start over, do something new. He abandons his family. He doesn't know. How does he understand? What is he doing? Why does he make a decision like that? What is he looking for? Because when I was young, and I didn't ever got to do that, I counseled somebody, it was a woman, who made a decision like that. She had a family, and she said, you know, I'm done. I don't want to be a mother anymore. I'm leaving, and she did. She abandoned her family. And it was like, you know, please don't do that. Wait, you need help. You need counseling. No, I'm not going to the church anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not my mother anymore. I'm out of here. I'm done. So how'd that happen? Well, we know. Uh, I just say it to, you know, to, to 
give some pastoral comment on some experience that I have had with people that sometimes do shocking things. Like, and nobody here is better than anybody. We're all capable. I'm not saying it as a judgment. I'm saying it to give us understanding of what we're all capable of. And if it hasn't happened to you, hallelujah, you can thank God. And if you get it in your mind, I, I do need a renewed mind. And Lord, help me because I can really get things wrong. And we said it last night in the service that you don't know how you can mess up your life left to yourself. Okay? All right, so you can talk for a minute if you want. Or ask a question after you talk, maybe. Okay, um, <clears throat> after last night's message, Pastor Stefan Stein uh, sent me this document, a PDF, and I had it printed out. And it's basically uh, goes like this, that it's a comparison between the natural man. So one column is the natural man and the other column is the spiritual man. And I would just kind of, we, I sent it to Pastor Steve so he can send it to you. And you can get this and read it. But I, I just point out a couple of things. The natural man is directed by his own ability and human nature. The spiritual man is directed by his relationship with the Holy Spirit and centered on the nature of Jesus Christ as imparted by the Holy Spirit in the context of guidance by the Scripture. So that was what Pastor said, basically, in his class. The natural man, man is centered in the perspective of myself, but the spiritual man is centered around his relationship with the love of Christ. 
a natural man is based on doing and how one appears to others. A spiritual man is based in his relationship with God. And he, he doesn't have the focus of how he appears to others or what is he doing, but he's at rest with God in the spirit. Uh, in the natural man, the self-life is at the center. In the spiritual man, Christ is at the center. In the natural man, what can I do for God? And then uh, the spiritual man is what I do with God. He's the primary initiator and the leader. And... Uh, I am a human, a sinner who is trying to live right, or I am marvelously made, made by God for the purpose of relating with Him for eternity. That one's a, that's a good one. That's number five. So you can you get the idea. You can read through that and understand it, and make the comparison. It's basically, Pastor is saying that because of the the spirit of the mind being renewed, then we actually begin, we think this way, with that Jesus is everything, that Jesus is at the center, I rest in him, he's like, I'm enjoying who I am in the Lord and who other people are in Christ and, and so on. And I have a capacity to hear from him. Okay, amen. Any question or comment before we go? Yeah. Good. You get, you get one chance. I mean, this is your chance. I'll ask you a question. You can ask me a question. Yeah, Patrick. Do you talk to yourself a lot? Do I talk to myself? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Hey, it's better, listen to this, this is a good statement. It's better to talk to yourself than to listen to yourself. Oh, yeah. Drop the mic. Oh, yeah. Woo-hoo! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Steve. Yeah. Okay, that it? Yeah. Okay, amen.